Are you cooking bananas? Would you expect me to eat them raw? Well, that is kind of the way people normally eat them. Since when? Since forever. Welcome to another photography tutorial for beginners. In this video, we're going to talk about the difference between JPEG and RAW, but for the bulk of the video, I'm going to explain what I think are the first 12 things you need to know about using Adobe Camera RAW to take advantage of all that information you get by taking pictures using RAW instead of JPEG. So to understand RAW, we first need to know what a JPEG is. And basically a JPEG is the image that is processed after you take the picture in your camera. So whatever white balance you have, exposure, whatever, is baked into an image based on the megapixels that you use and you have a JPEG image. A RAW file, on the other hand, is the unprocessed data recorded by the camera, which leaves a lot more room to modify certain settings using software such as Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom to process the image after the photo has been taken. On Canon T-Series cameras, to access your quality settings, you go into Menu, and you go to the first menu at the very, very top and hit Set. There you will see that, like most DSLR or mirrorless cameras, you can select from a wide range of quality and pixel count settings if you plan on shooting JPEG. But if you want to get the most out of your camera, you should select one of the two RAW options. The first being RAW plus JPEG, where you get a RAW version and a second JPEG copy of each photo you take. You can also just select RAW by itself. Once you put the files on your computer, you'll need a program like Adobe's Camera Raw or Lightroom to open the CR2 RAW files. As you can also see when we look at the files, the RAW or CR2 file is much bigger. It's saved at 18.3 megabytes, whereas the JPEG file is only 4.89 megabytes. So besides taking up a lot of room on your SD card because the file sizes are much bigger, the only other reason why you might not want to use RAW is because you don't actually have the software to process the image. So if you don't have something like Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom, or you don't even want to learn those just yet, then maybe stick with JPEG for the time being. But if you do have the software and you're ready to learn, then stick around because I'm going to count down my top 12 first things you need to know about using Adobe Camera Raw to process your RAW images, starting with number 12. Number 12 is camera information and settings. If we look in the top right in camera raw, we can see the aperture we used at 5.6, our shutter speed at 1 over 80, ISO at 200, and the focal distance we used on our lens. Number 11 is a combination between the crop tool, which allows you to resize your image by getting rid of parts that you don't want, and the rotation tools, which allows you to go from landscape to portrait and back. Number 10 is lens corrections, which can be found right here. We're not going to look at the manual part of it, just under profile, where I suggest selecting enable profile corrections, which you can't really see on here what it does, but it basically corrects distortion and vignetting from your lens. The other thing I would suggest is selecting remove chromatic aberration. In this image, again, we might not see too much of a difference, but what it does is it takes away like purple fringing that you might get along the edge of high contrast areas in your image. At number nine, we have white balance, which can be found in the main menu right here. At the top, there's white balance, and this drop down menu has all the presets that are in your camera. So if we selected daylight, this would look the same as if you selected daylight on your camera before you took your picture. We can also select tungsten, for example, even auto, or go back to what the shot was as we took it. Besides the drop-down menu, you can also adjust the temperature yourself, so you can make the image cooler or warmer if you want, and you can adjust the tint. Down at the bottom, you can also adjust your vibrance, so how much those colors pop, and saturation, so how much of the color there is or how little, by making it black and white. And if you have something that's close to pure white in your image, like I really only have this white string here, you can use this white balance tool, which allows you to select on that white spot and the white balance will be adjusted accordingly. Number eight is exposure, which can be found right underneath white balance. In there, you can change your exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. Basically, these allow you to control the lights and darks of your image. So for example, highlights, controls the lights, so I can make the lights darker or the lights lighter. For shadows, I can make the darks darker or the darks lighter. 
And then for whites and blacks, these are just the extreme versions of highlights and shadows. So whites are the extreme light parts. So the whites that I can again make darker or brighten. And then for blacks, I can crush the blacks or I can lighten them. Number seven is sharpness or texture, which is just below exposure. In texture, these are kind of the fine, you can see if I move it left, it kind of blurs things out. So this is like the, like a beauty filter on skin. It'll kind of smooth it out. Or you can increase this and you can see there's a lot more sharpness and detail in the images. Clarity is just an extreme version of that. So you can see that it's an even more drastic change from blurry or smoothing things out to the sharpness. And dehaze is really what you'd use if you obviously have a hazy image and you wanna bust through that by adding contrast to fight through the haze. Number six is HSL adjustments, which is the fourth one right here. What this allows you to do is adjust the hue, saturation, and luminance of each color individually in your image. So the reason why I picked this image is so I could show you that let's say with the blues, I can crank the blues here and I can adjust what the blues look like individually. Right up here, I can change, let's say is that magenta or is that more red? That's more red. Anything that's got a red hue on it is the thing that I am adjusting. And you can also do the same thing with saturation, which increases how much red is in the reds or how little, like I can make this almost black and white. And then luminance does the same thing, which is kind of how bright that red is or how dark that red is. Number five is presets, which is this little slider one right here. You just have to think of these as filters. So there's a warm shadows filter, flat and green. And just so you know, whatever one you select still allows you to go back in and adjust all the same settings that we were adjusting before. So just think of them as kind of like a different starting point before you adjust. Number four is histograms, which are found right at the top up here. And really the only thing you have to know about those is they're a graph or data representation of everything we do to our image. You can see that this like white or gray mountain, that's our exposure. And all the rest of these are basically our white balance, like our, our RGB values that you can see right here. So as we slide this exposure up, you can see that all the colors and the overall exposure of our image is moving to the right, all those mountains are moving to the right. And if you notice right up here, this helps us indicate if things have clipped so that they're too high that we can't recover. So we'd slide those back and on this side, it will tell you if the shadows are clipping. I would suggest learning more about histograms before you start using them as a reference though. Number three is the adjustment brush. Basically this allows you to go from a global adjustment. So when we're on the regular one, everything we do adjusts to the whole image. It impacts the whole image. Whereas when we select on the adjustment brush, we can, if we go down to the bottom way down here, you can adjust the size of your brush. So you can crunch it down and you can feather it. And this allows you to paint in areas that will be affected by whatever you have changed here. So I've bumped up the exposure so that everything that I paint is going to be exposed like that, but nothing else in the image will. So if I wanna make this kind of zone really pop out, I can do that. Or let's say I want to increase the clarity or drop the clarity down of that section. Now, whatever I do, you can see that it's impacting just those areas that I've painted. So you can go and adjust just those parts and leave the other parts alone. Holding down the number two spot is our preview. So if we go down here, this allows us to cycle through different views. So we can see the before and after. We can have it split screen like this. We can have it top and bottom or split screen top and bottom or back to normal where we just see the new one. This allows you to swap before and after. So let's say you like seeing the after over here and the before on the right. That's all this does is just flips them around. And this one will make it so that whatever we've adjusted, that will become your new before. So if you wanna set this as your before and then continue to edit from that because you like it, then click this one. The last slider here allows us to toggle between the current settings and default settings of the current panel that we're on. So if I click this, it'll take away that whole brush, adjustment brush stuff that we just did. And if I click on it, it'll put it back. 
if I go over to the main one here and I go back to something that we did over here, let's go our HSL adjustments and I crank, let's say this down. So I took away that red. Now I can toggle between what it looked like before I did those adjustments and after I did those adjustments, just for the HSL adjustments or whatever panel I'm selected on at the moment. And finally, the number one thing you need to know about using Adobe Camera Raw to process your images is what to do when you're done. So if you do not plan on using Photoshop at all afterwards to do anything else, then you can go to save image over here. In your save options, obviously you would select which folder you want to save it in and you would rename it right here. So I'm gonna name this chalk and then you just have to decide on your file extension. So if you want a JPEG, select that. And then I would come down here to quality and I would make sure it's on maximum. Put it right up to 10 and make sure it's the highest that it can be. If you need to go even higher, if you need a higher resolution file still, then change file extension to TIFF and then just come down here and switch this to 16 bits and click save. Now, if we look back in our folder, we can see that we have the original CR2 file, the original JPEG file, and a new TIFF chalk file that I just saved. And you can see that it's 69.6 .6 megabytes. So even far larger than the original CR2 was in the beginning. If you're not completely finished everything that you wanna do, you can also just click done, which will close out Adobe Camera Raw. And then the next time that you want to come back, all you have to do is open up that CR2 file again, Photoshop and Adobe Camera Raw will open back up with the exact same settings that you had before. But if you are gonna bring your image into Photoshop to do more work on it, then do not just click open image. Click on this right here, which brings up your workflow options. The only three things you need to worry about in here though are your space, switch this to Pro Photo RGB, switch your depth to 16 bits instead of eight. This is important because 16 bits will hold a lot more information in your image than eight bits. And then at the bottom here, this is the most important thing. Click open in Photoshop as smart objects, boom. And then click okay. Now this button down here switched from open image to open object. And if we click it, our image will open up in Photoshop as a smart object, you can see it right here. So if we added, let's say an image adjustment, let's just go with hue saturation and crank this up, you will see that it adds a smart filter on it, meaning it is non-destructive. And why this is important is because if we're not happy with our image, we can now double click on our thumbnail here and it'll open our image back up in Camera Raw to make further adjustments. So if we didn't like our adjustment brush stuff that we did, we can come back in here and go clear all and it'll bring it back to what we had before. Then we can make further adjustments, let's say in our temperature and contrast and you know, whatever, and then click okay. And it'll automatically adjust our image back in Photoshop to represent those changes. And if I click off of this smart filter, we can see those changes that were made. So those are my top 12 first things that you should know about using Adobe Camera Raw. If you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe and I will catch you next time.